Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from Luke chapter 11, verses 17 to 23. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I tri- drive out demons by Beelzebul. Now if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. bow with me. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your word. Lord, your word is truth. May it guide us into all truth. Lord, we thank you for your spirit that is with us each and every day that seals us that we are your children, Lord. We thank you that Jesus is our advocate in heaven, Lord, saying that that we are yours, Father. May we be guided by your spirit, sanctified through and through to be more like Christ in this world. May we long for the day that Christ returns and sets all things new. Lord, may we be kingdom children that bring glory and honor to you. Increase our faith. Guide us each day, Lord. Give us the strength that we need to live a life that brings glory and honor to you. Open our ears to hear what the spirit says, Lord Father, and help us to be guided. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Whose kingdom are you living for? We don't think about that so much today because we don't think of kingdoms as much. But the, king, the theme in Luke, the theme in Matthew is the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. It's repeated over and over again that Jesus says the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Change the way you think so it changes your life. If the kingdom of God is at hand, how are you going to pledge your allegiance to the king? How are you going to live as a result? The kingdom of God is mentioned 71 times in the New Testament. The kingdom of heaven 32 times. And there are over 50 more references of kings and ki- or of kingdoms. You're serving one king or another. That's what Mark read us. You're either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. There is no gray area. There is no neutral ground. If you're fighting a battle, if you're waging a, a war and it's with the principalities and powers of darkness then you are on one side or the other. If you think you're neutral, you are not. There is not a safe place from the enemy. Your enemy is like a lion crouching, waiting for whom he may devour. That's to eat you up, chew you up, dead and gone. Plain and simple. So if there are two kingdoms, there are two kings. Satan and Jesus, period. Who who is your allegiance pledged to? Who who do you live your life for? And these two kingdoms, these kings, are in conflict. And you serve one or the other. Kingdom does not mean in the Bible a physical region. It's not this kingdom over here. It's a way of life. It's being subservient. It's pledging allegiance to the one who has authority to rule over you. So if Jesus doesn't have authority in your life, there's a problem. You're not serving the true king. That means if you're not with Jesus, you're against Jesus. If you're not serving Jesus as king and lord of your life, then I hate to say it, but you're serving the other master of your life. So Jesus performs miracles in Luke. We're setting up this, the, the orderly account that Luke is writing. He dri- drives out a demon from a man who could not speak. And the religious leaders, um, or he drives out a, a demon from the man in church. That's where we were last week. And I entitled this this week, Taking the Pastor Out to Church After Dinner. Dinner after church. You know, a lot of people do that. Dinner after church. But I mean, all those implications are there. 
because a lot of times, especially in times of old, it's not as much now, and I'm not giving hints to take me out, <laughs> but you would take the pastor out to dinner afterwards. So after the, the, the preaching in the synagogue, Peter invites Jesus to his home. We don't know what all has gone on prior to this in Luke's account, but as we read other Gospels, we know that Jesus has performed many miracles already. We know that, that Peter uh, has come to follow him and Andrew and everything, and he's going to go to Peter's house to have lunch. This happens right after he drives out the man that we talked about, George, and I don't remember what we said now, that jumped up in church and we would have never thought there was a demon possessed man sitting with us in church but like I said last week also what about the demon oppressed people sitting all around and what are we doing about that if we don't realize that we're fighting this spiritual battle that we don't see that in this life this cancer that's here and this marital problem that's over here and the problem of the children over here that demons aren't using that to sit there and try to manipulate and guide people out of the truth into darkness, that God doesn't love them enough, that God's not in control, whatever the things that are in their life, let alone the people that are physically demon-possessed because that, those things happen. So after this, Jesus is invited to go to church, and we have a little different account, but let's read in Matthew first because Matthew tells us a little bit more. Matthew chapter 12, verse 22 and 23. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? This is the question again that we get. Who is Jesus to you? In Mark account in Mark 3, verse 20 and 21, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he is out of his mind. The spiritual battle that we face, that even our brothers and sisters and those in our family are divided against us. They said that Jesus was insane and he, they wanted to take charge of him. The claims that Jesus made, he was either a lunatic or he's God himself. And the miracles that Jesus performed could not be done any other way. That's why Nicodemus came to him at, at night and said, We know that you are from God. But Jesus said, Here's the problem. Are you willing to come out of the darkness and your deeds be exposed and come into the light or not? Do you love the praise of men? Are you fearful of what men can do to you? What are you, what are you afraid of that you won't come out of the darkness into the light? Jesus made claims that differentiated him than any other rabbi. He claimed that he was the Son of God. Do you believe that? If you believe that, then is He Lord of your life? Lord of all. If Jesus has a throne here on earth, where is it? Is it your heart? Because that's where it should be. Because if Jesus sits on the throne of your heart, then your life's going to be changed. You're going to serve the King. So what are the desires of your heart then? Because if Jesus is sitting on the throne of your heart, then your desires should be the desires that the Spirit puts in to love, to bring, about in, to bring about justice where there's injustice, to think of others over yourself, to love the Lord your God and thank Him and not complain, to be content and to have peace, peace that surpasses all understanding. In Luke 11, Jesus drives out a demon, and that demon talks and speaks. That's what I was reading from earlier. <clears throat> Jesus' family thinks that he's insane and tries to suppress him. I guess that's better than throwing him off a cliff, right? But think about that. This is, and I, I advanced, and I'm sorry that I didn't tell you I advanced early when I read that, so it didn't want to confuse you, but we're way part in the gospel and there's still this doubt of who Jesus is and there's still this spiritual battle that's raging in Jesus' own life with his ministry because the devil doesn't want you to come to saving knowledge and he certainly doesn't want you to be a soldier in the kingdom of Jesus. Jesus has, a, has authority and power. So as we read in Luke 11, verses 17, 23, it says, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? 
I say this because you claim that I drove out demons by Beelzebul. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be, so then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then what? The kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when str someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides his, up his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather, gather with me scatters. If you notice from that scripture, we've got a strong man and he's got full, full armor on again. Jesus tells us, just like Paul tells us, we're fighting a battle. And Satan is armed. This is his house until a new homeowner comes in and wipes it clean and you start serving the new king. Before you come to Jesus Christ, Satan is your master. He is your Lord. He is the owner of your house, whether you realize that or not. Whether you're a pretty good person or a pretty bad person or anything else, you're, you have all sinned and fall short of God's glorious standards, and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So has your house been swept clean? Who is, the, who is the ruler of your house? He's a strong man. He's fully armed. He guards his house and his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger comes, the one who has authority to cast out demons, the one who has authority to cast out sickness, the one who has authority to calm waves, the one who is king of all creation because he was there and created creation, the Lord of all, the, one, the reason that everything that we know has its being and purpose Jesus Christ, someone who is so much stronger and overpowers and takes away the armor so that Satan has no power, no influence in your life. And he divides up his plunder, who you used to belong to, now you belong to Jesus. Do you understand that? Because whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Divided kingdoms fall. So do homes. The kingdom is the big picture, and the house is the individual picture. Are you divided at all? Are your loyalties divided? Are your loves divided? We see all throughout the Old Testament as we're reading the constant adultery of God's children towards Him and the lack of, of worship and the lack of thanks and praise. So Jesus casts out demons over and over, proving His authority and His power, proving that His kingdom has come. But you've got to decide, as we read back in Matthew chapter 12, verse 23, could this be the son of David? The devil is strong. He's armed. He's got his demons that fight this battle with him. Oh, praise be to God that someone stronger has come. And not only that, but His angels are here to minister to us too in ways that we don't even have any idea. Sometimes you can look back and say, Wow, there's, there's no way that God wasn't with me and rescued me from this. But there's other times that we can look and say, Lord, you're not with me at all. I don't understand. But that's a lie from Satan. Because someone stronger has overcome the strong man that was in your life and you don't ever have to worry about that. You can tell Satan to flee from you. Jesus gave authority and power to his disciples to cast out demons. But he said, don't be excited about that. Be excited and joyful that your names are written in heaven. There's no neutral ground in this spiritual battle that wages war for your soul. I can't stress that enough. Because just because things are going good doesn't mean that, that the battle's not raging on. If things are going bad doesn't mean that the enemy has victory over you. Because we know without a doubt that we have victory in Jesus Christ and we need to fix our eyes on Him and fight the battle through the power of the Holy Spirit and through His Word. We can get, get into the parts of the armor that God has given us, His armor, which will extinguish all the fiery darts of the devil. So we left off with the people leaving church, leaving the synagogue. I'm just saying when church is saying it that way. 
And they all were sitting there saying, wow, what happened at church today? Can you believe that? Oh, I never thought about George being that way and blah, 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 blah. But this is all where it boils down to. What about that Jesus? He spoke and the demon came out of him. He has authority over things that we cannot even fathom whatsoever. And he set George free. But if we don't look beyond even the spiritual there, we're going to want Jesus for what he can offer us, which is what we see so many of the people did. That's why you read in John chapter 6 that the crowds departed from him because they didn't want the bread of life. And Jesus had to even ask the disciples, are you, going to, are you going to leave me also? Because it's easy to say, I want a Savior, if you even realize you need a Savior. But it's something else to say, you are my Lord. I bow down in allegiance to you. I give up my life to give it to you. But that's exactly what Jesus teaches, and he has the authority and the power. Demons obey him. Sickness obeys him. Nature obeys Him. Do you and I obey Him? So now it's time to take the pastor home for lunch, like I said. And here's our scripture from Luke 4, 4 38 to 44. Jesus left the synagogue. And He went to the home of Simon. Now as you read in other accounts, you'll know that it's Simon Peter. You'll know that, that and, Andrew lives with him. And you'll know uh, also from this passage and from others that Simon's mother-in-law is there. Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. Luke puts in it, it's a high fever. That's dangerous fever. In those days, especially without proper care, there's a very good chance that she might die. And they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness. Laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, You are the Son of God. We see this again. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to, to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogue of Judea. Synagogues of Judea. Now, boy, we've changed dramatically because we've gone from the city on the hill in Nazareth that rejected him and, like I said, wants to throw him off the cliff to now here everybody wants to, Jesus to stay. We want Jesus. But why do we want Jesus? No wonder the prosperity gospel is so popular. That's who they wanted. They wanted the Jesus that could heal them. They wanted the Jesus that could do miracles. They wanted a world where, hey, everything is better if I'm associated with Jesus. But Jesus says if, you're, if you come to Him, you're His disciple. You train up after Him. And you lay down your life for Him because you deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after Him. It's not... Everything is better. It is everything will be better. Everything will be made right. But now you might have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So I want you to fear no evil because I have overcome the powers of darkness in this world. Do you understand that? Will you live for me? Will you go because the Spirit leads you even to where you don't want to go? Will you let the Spirit lead you into the wilderness? Will you let the, sp the Spirit lead you to the neighbor's house that you don't like? Will you let the Spirit lead you to giving a life where you give more than what you earn so you have to pray for daily bread? Or do you fear? Do you trust the King and His, and His power and authority in your life, knowing that He'll take care of you? Why do you worry about the things of this world? Why do you worry about what you eat or what you wear? Doesn't God clothe the flowers and the birds? If you read Matthew and Mark, like I said, you learn that Andrew is there. You'll also learn that Jesus took her by the hand. It doesn't say that in Luke here. So you've gone from a point in the crowd with a man that's demon-possessed, and Jesus rebukes the demon with his mouth, with words. Jesus is the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. He is the words of, of life. 
Peter, that was part of Peter telling who Jesus was. You are the one that has the words of eternal life. Where else are we going to go? To now we've got a more intimate situation and he takes, not a man, but a woman. We want to put that in there. By the hand, we've got intimacy. Because Jesus wants to set you free, but he also wants to take you by the hand so that you know you don't have to fear anything. That you have intimacy with him. That you have fellowship with God as a child. That you can cry out to your father. Will you trust him as a father, a good father? Will you do that? So there's intimacy here. <clears throat> if you only had four weeks to live, how would you live differently? Well, I asked a guy, and he said, well, I would go move into my mother-in-law's house. And I said, what? Why would you do that? He said, because it would be the longest four weeks of my life. See, you didn't expect that. Why Peter was living with his mother-in-law, I don't know. I mean, he was. We don't know about his wife here or anything else. We know that that's where he was, and we know that they asked to heal the mother-in-law. We also know that when the mother-in-law was healed, think about it, high fever. You're going to be tired, you're going to be worn out, you're going to want to shower, everything else, and that's reasonable. She immediately got up to serve. Not just, and so I got to go back to the demon and say, how, how was George, that's the name I gave him if you don't understand that, how was he right after that? What did he say and do? Because now we see what Peter's mother-in-law does. She gets up and serves. There is no recovery time, nothing else. There is instant healed and I am ready to serve you, my Lord. And she got to know the touch of Jesus also. I mean, so much of this, you just skip over this passage and think there's not much meat here, but there's so much meat here. Are you ready? That's why we read the scriptures that Sherry read in the beginning. Are you ready, dressed, and serving the Master until He returns? Did He not leave you the keys to the kingdom? Did He not leave you with power and authority? Did he not leave you with good news that is so good to proclaim that the rocks will cry out if you don't? Verse 40, At sunset people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, laying his hands on each one, and he healed them. Okay, so Jesus came for dinner. Peter's mother-in-law is sick. He takes her by the hand rebukes the fever, she gets up and serves him. We don't know what else happens. A, a meal happens, he spent time there. I'm sure there was continued teaching stuff. I'm sure there was talking about, wow, again, did you see Jesus do this? Who is this man? Will I follow him or do I want just what he can offer me in the here and now? Or do I want just salvation if I comprehend that whatsoever, but I'm not willing to live for him as king and lord? No wonder on that day there will be many that cry out, Lord, Lord, we did mighty miracles in your name. We even cast out demons. But he says, depart from me, I don't know you. It's about having that intimacy with God himself. That's why God sent his one and only son. That's why the miracles are performed here so that you know without a doubt that Jesus is who he says he is. Biggest miracle of all, he was raised from the dead. And at sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness. Well, if you study scriptures and stuff too, they were orderly and everything. That means that more than likely he went to, to lunch right at noon because they, they blocked the hours. And at sunset, at six, he leaves the house and goes out. And there are all kinds of people because the word now has spread. Some of those people out of the house have potentially gone out in the streets and stuff and told about Jesus. And everyone is bringing everyone to Jesus because they have demons or sicknesses, both. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of diseases, and he laying his hands on each, he healed them. Verse 41, moreover, demons came out of many people. 
Wow, he has set everyone free in that area of sickness, some related to demonic activities, obviously from this, and just demon possession and demon oppression in general that was tormenting the people in their lives. Why? Because we live in a sinful fallen world, because we sinned. This is a tainted creation, and Jesus is going to restore all things. But if he restores you right now, did he restore you so you could get up and dress and serve him? I mean, it kind of makes sense based off this. He didn't really save them so they would go back and say, Oh, I don't have cancer and stuff now. What are we going to do? What am I going to do? Am I going to build bigger barns for all the good things I have? Or is my heart and attitude changed and said, Oh, I do have plenty of things. I'm going to help those who don't have things. I'm going to tell of the, the, the love of Jesus Christ who took me by the hand and set me free. He went from touching one woman to touching everyone. Now think about this from Scripture too. That means he touched all kind of unclean people. The religious leaders would have never, ever done this. Oh, I've got to examine myself again. Am I not willing to go to that person or that person because this person does this and this person does this? Or am I willing to go wherever the Spirit calls me and realize that we're all sinners and we can all be saved by grace? And because I know God's grace, I want to be gracious to others. Because God, I know God's love, I want to be loving to others. Because God has blessed me, I want to bless others. Laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Everyone who came to Jesus was healed. Now they've got a personal decision they've got to make in their life. Who is this Jesus? And how does that affect my life? Jesus did come to set the captives free, didn't he? Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, You are the Son of God. There's the proclamation again. They know it. They know what the end is. They don't want to see it come now, and they, they are against Jesus because their time has not yet come. I wonder if they got it still figured out because their time was over. They're still in this world that we're still fighting this battle, but they have no authority and no power over you. That is what Luke is writing here. Jesus is the one with the authority and the power. And as we read on, he gives it to each and every one of you. Do you realize that? And are you using it to the glory of the kingdom? You are the Son of God, but He rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because He wasn't wanting the testimony from them. He wants the testimony from you. They're not being redeemed. You are being redeemed if you believe in Jesus Christ. If you profess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, not Savior. Lord is what the Scripture says. That He is Lord of all because what He's done for you, you realize it. You realize there's no way that you can pay your sin debt. Blessed are the poor in spirit because you go before the throne and say, there's nothing that I can do except ask you for mercy and grace and you've given it to me by taking out your wrath on your son for me. Wow, what greater love. He would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. He was the chosen one from God, all that Scripture points to, the one that would save men from their sins. Demons know. They hear, they obey, and they tremble. Do you hear and obey? And do you tremble before the Lord, not in fear of punishment, but because of the awe of who God is and how much He loves you? So verse 42, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. Did Jesus get any sleep? i got to wonder that here, because at sunset He was bringing people and they were coming to Him. When do you think they quit coming to Him? So I don't know if he slept any that night. And then he went to a solitary place. Well, we know from reading more scripture, that was to pray. What was God's will? To give him strength the next day for, for all the things that he, that, he, that he was facing. 
And the people were looking for him still. And when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving. Now, I don't know what all they did to try to keep him from leaving, but they wanted the miracles and everything where they were so that their life would be better. This is not about our life here and now. It's about an eternal life where every tear will be dried away, where everything that is wrong will be made right, where we, we won't suffer, we won't die. Wow. Can we not fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith? Why do we get distracted by the things of this world? You know, Jesus had to be tempted again here too because he could have stayed in that just right there and done ministry. The word would have still spread. He could have still gone to Jerusalem. But he said, no, I must go and keep proclaiming the good news because that's the reason that I came. What if he wouldn't have been prayerful? What if he wouldn't have been in power and led by the Spirit? Would he have got distracted and said, hey, I'm doing my ministry but lost sight of the big picture and what God has set for him. So then i got to think about that for my own life. God has you where he's at, and yes, that's where you need to be in ministry, but is he calling you to something bigger? I don't know. I know he is calling you to be the example you are in the place you are, so are you being that example? But he said, verse 43, I must proclaim the good news of what? The kingdom of God to other towns also. It's time to repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Are you going to live as kingdom children? Because kingdom children, again, pledge their allegiance to the king. They're not worried about what the king gives them so their standard of living and their comforts can be better in this world. Because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. The word used in 40, verse 42, solitary place. If you don't study the scripture and read different accounts and stuff, you won't realize it. But it's the word desert. It's the same word used at the beginning of Luke chapter 4. The wilderness. This desert place. He began in the desert being tempted. It ends in that fourth chapter with him being in the desert being tempted again and in prayer from God because he's tempted to minister where he's at or tempted to be distracted so he goes to pray and be led by the spirit and what to do next he doesn't want to take the easy chair he knows that the road set before him means that he needs to deny himself take up the cross which will save us so that we can follow him all the way to eternity. That is why Jesus was sent. What about you? What about the call for your life, the commission in your life? You know that you're supposed to tell people about Jesus Christ and spread the message to wherever you go. You know that, just summing up the Great Commission very liberally. <laughs> and then to train up disciples. Once you do go and, t and talk to them, that you know God's Word enough, you've studied enough, that you handle the Word of truth rightly, that you are an approved workman before God. So are you reading? Are you studying? Are you spending time in Bible studies, fellowship? Are you digging into God's Word to get meat, not just milk, so that you can tell others about Jesus Christ and so that you can train them up? What if they didn't have anybody else to train them? What if God had put just you in the paths of your children to train them? Well, Luke chapter 5 comes up to Luke chapter 4, and there's not chapters in Luke's writing. So what happens next? After the people find him, he says, No, I need to go on preaching. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. One day, so we don't know exactly how long this is, and Luke's account is not necessarily chronological, one day as Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him listening to the Word of God. So Luke is writing this orderly account. We just went through the different places that, uh, of spiritual warfare, the demons being cast out, the, the sickness being cast out. Everyone changed from wanting to throw him off a cliff to stay with us. And now one day Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee. The people were crowding around him and listening to the Word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats 
let there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into the one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Oh, could Luke be trying to tell us something here? Here I am focusing on what I do. It's my job, and I'm ministering. I'm talking to people about Jesus at this point. You know Simon is. But as we read on, he's going to say, you've got to get the real point here. I want you to be fishers of men. This needs to be your prime example, your primary objective, regardless of whether you're here or where you are. Simon answered, Master. That's the first time we see that word here. He realizes who Jesus is and that He's His Master, His King, His Lord. We've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish, their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at, his knee, at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. He fell in allegiance to the King of Kings. He realized who Jesus was at this point, whether this was his conversion point or not, and he realized the depravity of his sin. And he said, you don't even need to be around me because of my sinful state. But this is why Jesus came, to set him free so that he could get dressed and serve the king until the king's return. Verse 9, For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the son of Zebedee. So we've got different disciples here. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their, net, their, pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and follow Him. Is this a teaching lesson for you? Is it a teaching lesson about what you do for your work, for your job? Is it a teaching lesson about who is Lord in your life? Is it a teaching lesson about letting Jesus make you into something you could never be otherwise? a fisher of men. No matter what all the other variables are leading up to that, Jesus will make you into one who has a desire, if he is king, to save others, not by your own power and your might, but by proclaiming the gospel message, the power and the name of Jesus Christ that leads to salvation, and no other name, because that's what you want to do with your life because you realize how sinful you were and how you were saved by God's grace, and you want to tell someone else the good news. So let's break it down just a little bit. One day Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee. The people were crowding around him listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. Luke takes us directly to Jesus' continued preaching that he said he was going to go do. But he's not at a church here. He's not in a home. He's just out in general public. He's out in the day-to-day -day work and day-to-day -day lives of people. Okay? And they are spending their day doing what they do for a living, fishing. What does that mean? Well, if you think about it again, they got up early. They got up before daybreak. They gathered together. They got their nets ready. They got their boats ready. They went out and were out on the water before daybreak or just as daybreak was coming up, and they have fished until they came back in, however long that is. They're tired. They've caught nothing. They're frustrated. Oh, it's their livelihood. This is how we make our money and feed our family. How are we going to feed our family? So many thoughts and things here to go through your mind to get you distracted. Oh, because we fight a spiritual battle again, so the demons are waging war and saying, Oh, you can't provide for your family. Oh, the tragedies that come in your life. What, whatever those things are that they're saying to you. It's been a long day. And here comes Jesus into your life. Are you going to have time for him, or are you going to go, poor, poor, pitiful me? He got into the one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon, so you've got to give him authority to take your boat. And he asked him to pull out a little from shore, a little from shore here. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. He taught the crowds. Are they listening, or is it going in one ear and out the other? 
Are they listening, but they want what they can get again? Or do they, are they listening to the, so they can understand who Jesus is, that God himself became flesh and blood, and how am I going to give up my life to serve him who gave up his life for me? Is this what you think when you read God's Word? How can it change me to be a better servant? Uh, a servant and slave is constantly used. That you give up everything else for the Master. We don't know how long Jesus taught, but He taught for some period of time. So I can see the fishermen, they're tired. They're out there in the sun, they're going like this. Right? They're like, well, uh, I want to hear Jesus' Word, but man, I'm tired want to go home when he had finished speaking he said to Simon put into deep water and put down the nets for a catch wait a minute so we're leaving the crowds we're getting intimate again because we're going out to deeper water the crowds aren't going to hear Jesus anymore this is for you guys it's not for everybody out there they've listened and heard this is time for you guys that said you got in the boat are you going to listen Deep water. That means I got to row again. They, didn't, they couldn't crank up the Yamaha and go buzzing out through there. They got to get out there. They got to get their gear back out again because Jesus said we're going to put down the nets for a catch. Really? <laughs> Jesus, I know who you are. I know I've seen what you got to do, but we're fishermen. <laughs> You're not. This is what I do for a living. Oh, when does pride ever come in like that? And anybody knows you don't go out in the middle of the day to the deep water and catch fish because the predator fish are there and everything. You're not going to catch anything. That's why we go out early in the morning. I looked at the fishing guides in the almanac. I know when to fish. But what happens? Put in the deep water and let down the nets. Go away from the crowds where the water is deep. Oh, deep darkness. A journey. Hmm. If we do catch fish, nah, we can't catch fish. There's no way we're going to have fish. But let's see. Jesus' word says, put out in the deep water and let down the nets. And there's a promise for a catch. Do you read the Bible and look for those promises? For those buts, you know, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And all the promises that are tied to, if you do this or that, Jesus will do that. Now, don't test Him or anything there. We know that from Scripture. But it says clearly here for a catch. What if they did not put down the nets? So I've got to ask myself again, how many times would I, would I not want to even row the boat out there? How many times would I say that I know what's going on? So there's no way. I've already been here in ministry. I've already talked to this person a million times. There's no way that they're going to be receptive to the gospel today. Jesus says, put down the net for a catch. And the point we've already talked about that is to catch men, not catch fish. And how many catch do they catch? Do they catch? Well, Simon answered the perfect way. Master. You see what Luke's writing here? It doesn't make any sense to me in anything else, but if you're compelling me by the Spirit to go into the wilderness and talk to this guy over here, then I'm going. And the catch may not come today. The catch may not come tomorrow. But the fervent, effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much, doesn't it? And you've got story after story after story of that mother who became a grandmother, who became a great-grandmother that prayed for her kids, and her kids came to salvation at the end of their journey, in the bottom of the ninth, but they came to Jesus. Isn't that what you want to do? Do you want to give up praying, or do you love those children and grandchildren enough to keep on having faith, to, to not put it in your time or anything, but to walk and do what the Master tells you to do? Master, we've worked hard all night. It's okay, I can express that. I've done a lot, and I haven't caught anything. I'm not arguing with him, I'm just pointing it out, because you are my master. This is the first time that we've seen uh, that word in Luke. The demons knew that Jesus was the Holy One of God, but now we're seeing it from a human being standpoint. But because you say so, 
That's it, because of your word that has authority. I will obey. I will let down the nets. Verse 6, when they had done so, oh, because I walked by faith, others see my faith and could follow. Maybe, maybe not. But what do they do if they see your hypocrisy and your doubt and your fear, especially your children and your grandchildren? Do they look at your faith and say, hmm, what kind of faith does he have? But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Nothing like that had ever happened to them. It shouldn't have happened. It's definitely a miracle. Peter already knows that Jesus is his master. He's already said that, but he doesn't have the comprehension yet because he doesn't see the depravity of his sin yet. So many times again, I want salvation. I see what Jesus Christ has done, but I haven't been poor in spirit when I've came to him. Verse 7, so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. What a harvest of fish. And we're not talking about fish again, guys. We're talking about souls for the kingdom of God because that's why we were saved, to tell others of the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. We don't know what the other fishermen did at this point. We don't know how that affected them. They're not in the story because Luke is writing this story, progressing from an unknown man that we don't know that I named George. We don't know his name was George. To an unknown named mother-in-law. To a person we do know that becomes a rock. And upon this rock, Jesus Christ builds his church and catches fish after fish. I mean men after men after men. And is still catching them today because Peter was obedient to his master and saw the depravity of his sin and the gift of salvation. So he worked it out with fear and trembling. Who is this Jesus? Verse 9, For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John. We know more of their story. The sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. Why do you say don't be afraid? Did Peter show any fear here? But what's in our heart? What's in our minds? What is this battle we're facing spiritually? To worry about what we eat. To think we're not good enough. Whatever the things are that you do that keep you from serving God the way you're supposed to serve God, and then you're not going to catch fish, men, the way that maybe you were supposed to catch fish and men because you failed to take the boat out to the deep spot because you didn't cast your net, because you did it in a reluctant way. Peter said, Master, I'll do it. I think it's silly. I don't understand it, but I'll do it. He didn't argue and say, why do you want me to or anything? But he still had the comprehension that he, he couldn't figure it out as a man, but because you say it, I'll do it. That's okay comprehension because I'll tell you, there's so many times I have no clue, Lord, why you would do this this way, what you're going to do here, but I'll do it because my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I don't have any understanding that you do that can not only tell the ways to calm, but you know everything and keep them all in working accord. How in the world can I not see creation and to see that you've lovingly done it and you have control of all things? Will I give you control of my life? So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything and followed him. Wait a minute, it doesn't say Peter anymore, does it? It says they. So I can tell you what the other men were contemplating as they watched Jesus and they watched Peter. They had come into the presence of God Almighty and it changed them forever. Have you experienced that? 
There's a Greek word. The verb tense is bathuno. It's used here in Luke 6, verse 48. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep. There's your verb usage where Luke used the noun usage to cast into deep water. Without going deep, what would happen? Aren't you digging deep spiritually into your life, into God's Word, inquiring to Him what you want to do? Because if you're just doing shallow, you're just drinking milk. You're still an infant. You're not growing. You're not eating solid meat. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep because if he didn't dig deep, his foundation wouldn't be strong. And he laid a foundation that way on rock because he got past all the other stuff. Oh, that noun word is used also in the soil where when the sun came out and scorched the plants it's because they didn't have deep root. Are you digging deep into the faith that you proclaim that you have so that you can live a life that brings glory and honor to God? Are you spending time in His Word? Are you spending time in fellowship? Are you spending time in prayer? Or is your relationship shallow? Because a flood might come. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but did not shake it because it was well built. You know what happened to the other guy's house. So I don't know about you again, it's just like with childlike faith. I know the seeds were scattered by God, there is word, so that they would produce a crop. I know here that I need to dig down deep and put a firm foundation. Because if I don't, my house may tumble. And I don't want my house for my kids and my grandkids to, to tumble. Will you dig down deep? Jesus will do his part. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are a mighty, awesome, loving God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus doing all that he did and for when he was on the cross saying, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing. We thank you also that he said it was finished and that you accepted his sacrifice, his passion, his love for us, his humility, his, his mercy. Oh, Father, that he would go silently. I can't control my tongue when I want to speak out and justify my own self. And Jesus went silently because he came to lay down his life to save his friends that were his enemies at the time, Father. Father, we ask you to increase our faith. We ask you to take out the, the distractions, the th sins that entangle us, the, the spiritual warfare that we're facing, Lord, and just fix our eyes on Jesus. To realize that He is King of all and pledge our allegiance to Him. Realize that we are fighting this battle and that we need to decide whose side we're on and fight for that King. And Lord, we do thank You that we have a hope that others don't have. A hope that we know complete with complete confidence that Jesus will return, He will claim His own, and He will wipe every tear. So we put it in Your hands, Father, and we want to be Your obedient, humble servants. Give us the power and the authority, Lord. Teach us day, daily as we dive into your word and we fellowship together to be more like Christ until his return, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.